I started programming in 1969. And in 1969, I actually programmed computers that did not have a program that you stored in the memory of the computer. You programmed it with plug boards or you programmed it with paper tape. And from there, I programmed computers that would, didn't have an operating system. You, you wrote the program and you, in effect, booted the program and the, the device controllers would be linked into your program, not into the operating system and it only ran one program at a time. People who worked in industry, people who worked in business, they were still used to buying software like Unix and things like that, or, or MVS or VMS for their server systems that were not the binary only stamped out like cookie cutters. They didn't go down to their store to buy their Oracle database. They didn't, you know, that was still something that they purchased and was tuned and installed and whatever. So you have to look at the entire marketplace, the entire history that comes, comes out. So now, in 1984, there was this guy named Richard Stallman at MIT who decided that he didn't like this. He liked to get the source code. He liked to see how it worked. He liked to be able to change it. And so he developed this project called GNU. GNU is not Unix. And he was going to make an entire operating system that was available in source code form and covered by certain laws, which he called the GPL, the General Public License, to be able to distribute this code to anybody who needed it for any purpose, and to allow them to change it, and to keep other people from taking what people had written and making it binary only. And some people call this copyleft, okay? So that instead of copyright, it's copyleft. But by this time, people were used to buying this binary-only stuff, and people created business models around this binary-only stuff. And over time, people started to realize that they were trapped because all of a sudden, you know, they would have this computer, it was going along perfectly fine, and there would be some type of new virus or, or stuff come out, and they'd go to get a patch for it, and this company would say, well, I'm sorry, we don't support that anymore. You have to get the new version of the operating system. And they say, well, wait a minute, the new version doesn't work on my old hardware. And they say, oh, we have to upgrade the hardware. We upgrade the hardware, you get the new operating system, now you find out your applications don't work. We well, need a new copy of the application. Of course, that costs you money too. Not only that, but the interface has changed, and so you have to retrain your, your customers, your employees, in how to use this. And this, you know, and people started to see this. And then all of a sudden, there was this nice young man in Helsinki, Finland, this college student who took all this GNU software and MIT software and Berkeley software, and he developed this kernel called Linux. And people created distributions to create free software. And people said, well, it's free because you don't need to pay for it. No, no, it's free because it gives you the freedom to have the choice of what you're doing with your computer. It gives you the choice of whether you want to upgrade to the newest version of the operating system or whether you're going to hire somebody to put in the patch you need to fix the problem you have. And you continue to use the same hardware with the same operating system, with the same applications, but you fix the problem you had. That is choice. That is control. That is the opposite of slavery, okay? And that's what we talk about when we say free software. If Richard Stallman made a mistake, he didn't call it the Freedom Software Foundation. He said the Free Software Foundation. I bought the Nexus 4 from Google, and I bought it for two reasons. Number one, it was unlocked. And number two, it could run an operating system that was unsigned. Okay? which means that if I, buy an op if I buy a phone with a signed operating system, I can only boot that operating system because the firmware of the phone will only allow me to boot that operating system. But if I buy one that's unsigned, then I can change the operating system to meet my needs and put it on there and boot it. Now, you may have heard of routing phones, okay? That's breaking that signature, okay? It's allowing somebody to change the operating system, to change the image, so that they can put their own image on there. And there's lots of people that do that every day. So they are rejecting the concept of using the operating system as it came from the manufacturer or anybody else. I mean, you're sitting there and you, somebody downloads 
the operator downloads a new image to your phone to fix bugs, to fix, you know, whatever. In effect, they're changing the operating system to run on that phone. And so there's really no reason why you couldn't put any operating system on that phone. Then we go down to the question of what the operating system is. And Firefox OS uses the Linux kernel. Android uses the Linux kernel. Ubuntu uses the Linux kernel. So in reality, you could put layers on top of that Linux kernel to be either Ubuntu GNU Linux or Firefox OS or something else. It's a different set of libraries and everything else that goes on top. The things that typically come from the manufacturers are the device drivers that fit into the Linux kernel. Okay. And even there, you could reverse engineer those device drivers to produce your device drivers that would go onto some other kernel if you wanted to. And here's the other thing. You know, a lot of computer science, a lot of computer history, like it or not, was in Western Europe and the United States. And, you know, the so-called developing countries, you know, were locked out by the prices. Sure, they had computers and stuff like that, but not the person on the street. But as the price of the hardware continues to drop, this is changing. And, you know, these people, they're, they're price sensitive, very price sensitive. And if you're saying, hey, there's a, you know, the iPad versus a Nexus 7. Nexus 7 was $199, okay? And you got a very nice pad, you know? You could argue it was as nice as the iPad, but it was still nice. And what were you paying for the iPad? Five, $600? So in this, in this other place, it's going to be selling like this. And you can go out now, you can look on Amazon, you can look at these places. You can get a very nice pad, quad four pad, for $45. So at Campus Party Berlin, uh, we had the Raspberry Pi people come over, and they put together uh, a workshop. And I sat down with one of the, one of the Campus Heroes, and we had this little LED, and we made it blink. And I thought this guy was going to jump right out of his seat, right, go right through the ceiling, because it was just, oh, it blinked, it blinked. And then we got to blink in different ways and stuff like that. And, he, he, and the more we made it blink, the more excited he got. I've been very critical for the past 10 years of universities who believe the only thing you have to teach students is Java. And I go, no, no. You have to teach them assembly language. You have to teach them how the machine works. You have to teach them that it has registers and memory and cache and buses and, and time. You have to teach them that this rotates, this kids move, tape start and stop, because this is a thing that's going to allow them to write either really great programs or really crappy programs. And people say, well, all you have to do is teach them Oracle and stuff. And you know, they'll never be able to write the great programs that way.